uh, having a deep playbook. So one of the plays that you've mentioned in one of your podcasts, the, uh, the Not Your Father Stocks podcast, which you host, is your biotech investing strategy. So could you sort of go more into that, you know, what kind of companies you buy and what, what you actually look for? Now, you've got a strategy that I believe you call the biotech failed drug strategy. So uh, could you sort of describe that one? Yeah, I kind of like that one where, you know, I am looking for biotechs that have one drug only. And uh, really, the strategy is based off of the idea that the more cash in the business, and if it's a business with a lot of cash, really no liabilities, you know, there, and it's trading at that value or underneath that value, there's really low what I would call real risk, right? If me and you own the business and we have $200 million cash, no liabilities, uh, and the business is selling for $100 million and we have no products, we are a biotech with no drugs left in the pipeline, uh, we're gonna do something similar to a reverse merger or we're gonna take all the cash and we're gonna get rid of it. But if we do do a reverse merger, we're not gonna do a deal at 100 million because we have $200 million in the bank. So we're gonna do you know, a deal that's appropriate for you and I as the shareholder. Uh, and that's generally what happens. And a lot of people kind of are scared of buying you know, companies with a boat full of cash and no liabilities. And to me, it's like, I have no problem doing that. I think it's a great opportunity. I've played that strategy quite a bit always seems to work well. Uh, and yeah, and, and, you know, these are the types of pattern recognition that I think is really important in investing versus like, you know, looking at stuff on a chart, you know, you should really be digging into uh, something that's repeatable, right? The bio, the failed drug is something that happens often. And, you know, if you do find a failed drug that is trading under cash value, well, <laughs> You know, that's a pretty darn good opportunity and it's very repeatable where you see this, this happen, you know, every so often. And when you do find it, that's a mispriced bet and you should, you know, probably take that bet. Uh, now, does it work every time? No, but majority of the time it does work. And, you know, if you allocate the right way, you can play these over and over and over again. So, yeah. And, and, Building a playbook is super important. I have really kind of focused the last, you know, all of 2020 has been a, you know, I really kind of laced up my sneakers when coronavirus hit. We, we saw some crazy stuff go on, what, in March where the, you know, the S&P was actually getting halted and stuff like that. It was like totally bizarre. I'm totally like, you know, okay trading through halts and stuff. Uh, because I do trade a lot of these smaller uh, cap companies where that does happen. But to see that, you know, the S&P and stuff halting was, I mean, truly insane. And I know people were probably like, what the hell's going on? Uh, so when I did, you know, I was noticing all these like, okay, look, hey, I got to brace myself. The plane might be going down here. How do I make sure I'm in good position to navigate through this and stay alive? Uh, so what I did is I really started focusing hard on, okay, what are my core strategies and how do I attack those to the best of my ability before the, the plane, you know, hits the ground here. And to my surprise, you know, the, you know, the Fed maybe printed some money and we are, no longer in that, you know, high turbulence atmosphere. We are, you know, cruising right along to all time highs and who knows how high we'll go. And what I recognized in my own trading and my own investing is that, wow, I should have really been doing this the whole time. Uh, and I've missed out on massive gains because I was, kind of too busy messing around with a meaty, very, very mediocre short opportunity in something like Tesla. So, you know, finding stocks that are mispriced bets is not that difficult. And my number one strategy right now is finding stocks that release news. News is irrelevant. 
bet is really, really juicy. And we're looking at major day one price discovery. And you bet that I'm out there making sure that this thing gets priced appropriately. And, you know, I've been finding stocks at, you know, say $5 a share in legitimately, you know, covering, shorting them at five and covering them, you know, two fifty. Three dollars in a day, and these are these are really bizarre times. I've never really had this happen so frequently. Uh, I've had it happen a couple times before, but I'm actually seeing this, you know, a lot. So right. for me, and if you know, if I ever did want to really manage some money, and you know, I, that would have to be my core strategy. And I would really, you know, just should I really should just focus purely on that and kind of you know, let the market make noise around Tesla, Apple stock splits, all that stuff. It's really irrelevant to me. And it's not going to help me in any way, shape or form. If these stocks are running that I know, and I know how to catch these fish, you know, that's all I got to do. And, and if I focus on that, there's no doubt in my mind, I will have, you know, significant alpha and kind of basically crush uh, my peers, because I've kind of taken the time to really, really build out a full trading strategy where I have a, you know, I know exactly what I'm doing from, you know, 5 a.m. when I wake up until 11 o'clock when I'm kind of done for the day. And I'm right off the bat, you know, reading the news. I know how I'm getting into these positions. I have a, I have a trading strategy. And that's another thing that I kind of want people to understand is that when I wake up in the morning, it's right off the bat, I have the, the hat of the investor. But when the stock market opens or, or even pre-market, when it's time to get into these, into these positions, you actually need to change your thinking to that of a trader and say, okay, how am I going to be in best position to maximize my return here? You know, what, what price levels am I, what do I want, you know, this bet to get off at? How much size do I want to get? You know, is this something that can, uh, is this the type of news that can really catch wind? And, you know, like you said, go up 50, 100%. If so, I need to be extremely patient. Or it could be something like MOXC and absolute trash news. Two trash companies, you go on their websites, you look at them, they're, you know, ugh, disgusting. I don't have to really worry about that news being too, too pumpable because it's, you know, anybody that puts in 15 minutes of research is going to see what's going on here. And if they know how to play the game, they probably have a little bit larger bankroll than, you know, maybe some of the clowns on Robinhood that are buying this stuff. And really that's what it comes down to. I really focus on who my opponent is. I want to know, you know, and I, I'm a little bit nuts. I have, uh, you know, my, my competitors profiled, right? The Robin Hood trader has very, very predictable characteristics where, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, 955 and this thing's not breaking out to new highs, they're already selling. They're literally already getting out of the position. Uh, so those are those types of stocks that they're looking for. I'm taking, you know, the action on the other side of them and I'm kind of, you know, showing them, hey, this is not how you play. Uh, and even on the, on the, you know, on the long side, you know, something like ICCC or SMSI or even Tattooed Chef, you know, you should know who, who's on your team here, who are your competitors? Uh, is there a short thesis? Is it any good? If the best, the best long is a really bad short thesis. And, you know, I've seen, I've seen these mediocre short theses, you know, where you get someone really piled in and they're like, you know, babbling on, though, this is a short, this is a short, this is a short, and the stock just keeps going up and up and up. They have really no risk management system in place. And, you know, next thing you know, it's kind of like a, a short squeeze and you get the stock grinding higher and higher and higher and no one really understands why. Well, it's because the short seller's backwards. And when the short seller gets backwards, the market sees it going up, that just adds pressure, right? It's just like a little bit more of a catalyst to the fire. And then you get, you know, a Tesla type move, right? Where it's just completely bizarre. 
but it happens and it's and it's very real the money that's being lost on the short sellers is very very real and it's probably very painful 